Thank you for uh, introduction. So welcome here in uh, headquarter of, of HTO. So the first question, how many people is here for the first time? Oh, okay. Plenty of people. So let me quickly just say what we are doing, what was HTO. So this is really headquarters so of HTO. The HTO was created uh, today is 2019, so uh, almost eight years ago. And what we are doing, we are doing machine learning and AI. And machine learning uh, tools for, to support machine learning and to support model building, model deployment, and so on. And I will show you today some part of the things which we are doing. And uh, you know, from the beginning of the company, we grow a lot. So this is the uh, headquarters where we have probably like 60% uh, of the engineers, but we have fully distributed team. We have the office in Prague, we have office in India, and a lot of people around, around the globe and still growing and hiring. About a uh, few words about me. Before HTO, I spent a lot of time in academia, you know, typical path, finishing the master in computer science, then some PhD, postdoc at Purdue, uh, looking at the distributed systems and building uh, how to distribute uh, machine learning algorithms, and then join HTO, and you know, right now helping with engineering, and helping with hiring, and helping with uh, all the products which we are uh, building. And today, I would like to look at one part of, uh, of our job, which is uh, describing or supporting machine learning lifecycle. So that's our uh, daily daily work. So how, what we are dealing with and uh, what is that? What's what's what? How we can describe this machine learning lifecycle? And probably a lot of people are familiar with that. So typically, what we are dealing with, a lot of people have a lot of data, a lot of data sources. So what they are doing, they are uh, performing some data engineering on the data sources. And data engineering is a typical job that you're doing the joins, you are filtering the data, and trying to put data to some format which can be used for machine learning. And that format, typically, what we are dealing with is a tabular data, and also supervised models. And supervised models, it means that the data are labeled, labeled by some uh, label, by some uh, target which you like to predict. So this is like typical job of data engineering. The, se the next stage, when you have data in this tabular format, and a tabular format which compose of input features, and input feature you can imagine like the age and uh, address, location of business, for example, and the target, and target can be if a uh, loan application is rejected or your uh, interest rate, if you have data in this format, then you can start, uh, we call it a modeling pipeline or machine learning pipeline. And that's typically start with some feature engineering. And feature engineering is like taking the data and extracting the signal from data. And the feature engineering can compose, can include the uh, steps like uh, encoding of categorical values. If you have a, feature which say uh, blue, red, and green, you like to encode that feature in some notion that uh, that feature is uh, understood by your uh, machining models. The same for missing values, how to, uh, how to deal with missing values. Or you scale your data, or you normalize your data. So there are a lot of like tricks which uh, people learn over like a uh, decade where uh, machine learning is uh, popular and people know what to do. It's just really annoying job to do that like uh, manually. And then if you finish your uh, feature engineering, you start with modeling. So then you take tool like H2O or Scikit or R and feed your uh, engineering data to the tool and the tool will apply some algorithm, algorithm mostly, you know, something for linear regression, uh, three models to deep learning, and uh, the algorithm will build a model. And the model is just encoding of some math. For linear model, it's just a linear function. For three models, it's a, a lot of lot of uh, predicates which say, okay, for this for this uh, scenario, the prediction is uh, that the loan is rejected with a probability of sixty percent. 
and that's it of the for the model building. So this is like typical typical process which we are dealing with. But this is only model building. So this is just a for my perspective of like engineering perspective is just a start of whole process. If I have model in the hand, what I can do? How can the model be beneficial for for the company for for the application we are building? So the next stage is to deploy the model. So somehow the encode, the pipeline, the model building pipeline, which I describe it, somehow encode in the way that I can take it and deploy it. And we are dealing with a lot of deployment scenarios. So there are like scenarios, deploy the model on the Spark, deploy the model as the Amazon Lambda, deploy the model as the library in my application, deploy the model as, as the REST service or as a gRPC service. So there are like really uh, dozens of use cases which are dealing with, or we, which are dealing with in production. And that's quite challenging because uh, the uh, model building part, there are a lot of, uh, it's a, a part where data scientists are uh, participating and they are dealing with tools like Python, they're not so familiar with Scala or Java or at some low level language like C, C++ or Rust, but at the deployment stage, you suddenly have some functional properties like uh, latency, which you have to satisfy, and where the tools which are used for model building doesn't scale. So you have to figure out the way how to put the models from this model building stage to the production stage. And uh, in h we support it in different ways. So I'd like to show you in this talk two examples. One example will use the uh, open source stack. It will use tool which is called Sparking Water, and I will describe it later. And uh, it will combine uh, Sparking Water with the power of Spark for uh, data engineering and feature engineering. We'll use uh, Sparking Water and H2O for model training, and then Spark, Spark streaming for deployment. Then, and in the second part, I would like to show you how to use our uh, second tool, which is called H2O Drive AI, which is the enterprise product, and how to do the same thing and uh, deploy Drive AI model as uh, a Spark stream. So let's start with the first example, with the Sparking Water example. So Sparking Water is the combination of H2O and Spark. Our goal was to, when we were, you know, we are dealing with Spark a lot because it's a like really popular uh, tool which we are see seeing in the field, and mostly people using that for uh, data engineering and feature engineering. The machining part that's our strong, that's our strong, uh, strong part of our job, and we, that's why we are uh, combining Spark with H2O and uh, we are injecting to the Spark uh, the H2O capabilities for model building. And that's the project which is called Sparking Water. And there is a lot of uh, thoughts which I have before, or my colleague uh, Kuba, who is working from Czech, about like Spark, Sparking Water, which you can find on the, our YouTube channel or uh, on our sites, which goes a little bit deeper to the internals. But just in short, uh, the sparking water really deal easily with uh, any version of Spark. If you are using Spark 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, or the latest one, 2.4, you just append uh, the sparking water library on the class path, and you can use H2 uh, as a model building uh, as the as the model builder inside the Spark. And our uh, design uh, goal was to be really transparent. So we really follow all the rules or all the design decision which Spark did inside their API. So we provide a, a API which looks like a Spark transformers. We also provide an API to incorporate uh, our, um, we call them H2 frames, our uh, tables, which we are using for computation, which, uh, we are exposing them under the SPAR data frame and data set API. And uh, the goal is that people can use it in transparent way. So uh, this tool we will use in the way which is uh, shown on the slide. And what we will do, we will do 
some uh, data engineering in the Spark, also some feature engineering, really simple feature engineering in the Spark. Then we will switch to the Sparking Water and H2 algorithms. We use AutoML algorithm, which is algorithm which will find the best possible model for uh, given data and given constraints. And there was then, then we will export the model as a Spark pipeline and deploy as a Spark streaming job. So that's, that's my goal. And the use case, which I would like to like, target with data, I will explain in a second. So I will switch to the demo mode and show you step by step what, uh, what we can do. So let me a little bit increase the font size. So let me launch uh, Jupyter Notebook with the simple uh, simple demo, which helped me to train to train the model. I will share also this code on our GitHub, so you'll be have access to that code. So you'll be able to try it at home and try uh, try to play try to play with it and modify it. So we'll, what we'll do? We will. Uh, okay, thank you for comment. Is it better? Perfect. So the first step, I said, we'll use Spark and Sparking Water for building, uh, for model building. So I have to prepare the uh, Spark and Sparking Water environment. So I already prepared the kernel, Jupyter with Spark kernel. So I just verified if I have, I have the Spark session ready. And uh, let me check. OK, it's starting. So let's wait a little bit to start the, uh, the, uh, the Spark kernel. OK, I know why it's taking too long, because I lost the internet. So let me just verify that I have the internet. OK, I have it. OK, let's wait. I didn't set up the, my, uh, my Spark local IP environment property, so that's why it's taking too long. So maybe it's better better to kill it and switch to my iPhone in this room and repeat repeat the process one more time. So let's start again. So the kernel is running again. I will open the no notebook and let's repeat that. Okay, give me the Spark, give me the Spark, uh, Spark session. Okay, so in this case, I'm running tiny instance of Spark on my computer. You know, you are familiar with Spark. This is just local mode. This is the latest version of the Spark 2.4, and I'm running uh, uh, the Spark as the as the Jupyter kernel, so I can easily use it in the in the Jupyter. So the second thing, just you know, in, import uh, PySpark and PySparkling modules. I set up the kernel in the way that I have access not only to PySpark packages, but also to PySparkling packages, which are uh, uh, the gateway to H2O models. And then the next step is to create, we call it H2O context. So that's a similar thing as uh, as a Spark context or as a Spark section, which uh, which allows me to connect to the H2O cluster. In this case, I will launch the H2O cluster on the top of the Spark cluster. They will share the same JVM, but there are different modes. I can launch it in separation. I can launch it in a distributed way. But in this case, for this demo, I will just launch it locally and uh, and use it. When I launch the H2O context, this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the gateway to uh, uh, to access the H2O API. So the H2O context gives me a few information about about uh, H2O running. You know the latest version, which was like released five years ago. Uh, whatever uh, machine I am running, this is my laptop. A few technical information about configuration. So. I have the access to uh, the following algorithm, SGBoost, the, the core algos, AutoML, 
and uh, and so on. I have also to access to the UI. I will get to that closely. But the next step is to load data. So let me load the data, and then I will explain what I what I will try to do. I will load data through the H2 API. That's a shortcut. I can do that through the Spark. In this case, I do that through the H2 API because I don't want to bother with set up the parser. The, in H2, we tuned the parser for the last seven years. It's quite stable. It can handle a lot of CSV, CLV, CSV variation, which we saw in the field. And it's, you know, I'm lazy, so it's much more easier for me. I load the data, and if I look at the data, you will see a lot of columns. And this is the time to explain what I will try to do with the data. This data are the data which we collected from our training runs in DRAS AI. The data saying for a given combination, for a given hardware, for a given co combination of parameters, how long DRAS AI will train the model. And this is quite interesting for us because when we are collecting this data, we are running a lot of uh, jobs locally, we can train the machine, mo machine learning model on top of this, this data and deploy this model as a, par, uh, as a part of the product. And the model will just give the estimate for given data and given input was the estimate that uh, DRAS AI will run, if it will be minutes, hours, or days. So I just use part of this data and try to do the same, same job. Build a regression model, which will, gives me, which will give me the estimate how long uh, DRAS AI will train for the given parameters. If I look at the data, there is, uh, let's say, a lot of details about uh, our environment and about the experiments which, which we are running. So we are looking, does the machine, has the, does the machine have a GPU? Vo how many GPUs? How many CPU scores? What were the settings? What were the settings of the, uh, of the, for the DRAS-AI platform? What was the settings for the input data? How many columns? How many features? And this is really like subset. I'm a little bit cheating here, so I just write in the subset of data. But what I would like to predict is this t total. So it's number of seconds, how long does AI run the experiment? How long it takes to train a model? I can look at the data in this form, or I can go, since I'm running Spark in water on top of Spark, I'm running H2 service, I can also access the H2 API or H2 UI. So what I will do, I will look, I will open the H2 AI, I will increase the form that you can see. This is you know, part of the open source product. You can, uh, you can try it on your laptop. I just open the UI. The UI is kind of the interactive notebook. I can list uh, all the data which were loaded in the H2 and access the properties of data. So this is really similar uh, data which I show in the Jupyter notebook, just uh, visualize in our, uh, in our product. I can look also a lot of like characteristics of data which we are which we are producing like what uh, was the distribution was the man mix values and this is you know part of the uh, product or part of the metadata which are computing by default that's why I wanted to load the data also through the H2 because I know that I will have this characteristics of data computed for free. So I have the data, and I will just show you the t total. The t total is my prediction target, number of seconds, how long dress AI trained the model. And you see, it's really imbalanced data set. So a lot of short experiments and long, long tail. Long, long tail because there are some, you know, maybe bad setup, then we really spend of exploring wrong, wrong uh, part of the, uh, of the model space. So I have to think about that a little bit more, how to do, how to do the modeling. So I will go back to the, to, the, to the Jupyter notebook and try to define the Spark pipeline, which will build the model. And I saw that uh, there was like long tail. And if I will look a little bit deeper, I will see that uh, the long tail is caused by specific data sets, some bigger data sets. And for this case, we know that uh, there was some problem that we were not, uh, not training uh, correctly for this big data set. So 
my first, first engineering step is to remove them. So I will say, remove all the lines with, uh, with, uh, where number of training rows is higher than uh, 30,000. So they will remove my tail in the, in the distribution. So this is my first step in the modeling pipeline. And the second step, you know, I will not bother with any, any additional feature engineering. I will just pass the data directly to the AutoML algorithm. This is part of the open source HTO, so it's uh, AutoML, so technically it's like grid search, which is looking, which is exploring the space of the uh, models and models parameters and try to find the best possible models with res respecting given constraints. In my case, I just uh, limit the runtime, so this is the maximum time second, so this is like recommendation spends like around like one minute to find the best possible model, not the best settings, but you know, just for the case of the demo. And some just say, I will just tell the mod, uh, modeler auto, auto ML, I will just say, predict me uh, the T total, which is the, the runtime of the, of the DRAS AI. So that's my two-step pipeline, really simple modeling pipeline. So I will start the training. There is one more technical step. Since I loaded the data through the HTO, I need to publish the data as the Spark data frame. So there is explicit action for that. This, this operation as Spark frame will just wrap our HTO frame as the Spark data source and uh, use it. And then I can use it as the Spark data frame. That's it. So. I will start a uh, model building, so it's a classical Spark pipeline. So I will just call a uh, pipeline fit inside the pipeline. The, uh, the defined transformer will be, will be executed. I can go back here to the UI and ask get jobs, which are running. And there is one job, which is AutoML job. You see that it's still running. The remaining time is two minutes, but you know there is like a lot of uh, magic which tries to uh, reflect our stopping criterion. I uh, defined the stopping criterion to be one minute. I did, did, didn't define any accuracy related stopping criterion, but uh, if you look to our API, it can be defined. For example, you can say, I'm just interested in the models uh, with given improvement of the accuracy, or if there is uh, the model which after which on validation data have uh, the given AUC. So there is a lot of potential or a lot of uh, capabilities in the API how to how to uh, constrain the uh, the building process. So you see that runtime was one minute. So you know, we reflected uh, my requirement which I specify run the model around one minute and. I have my model, I will go back to the pipeline and I can look at the model. So it's a still the model is a Spark pipeline. So it has two transformers, SQL transformers, which I define, which, which remove some rows from the data set and then module model. If I write it to the disk, so this is just Spark API, write to the disk, I can look what was written, and this is the structure of the Spark pipeline. So it's a lot of stages, the stages which I defined, and some metadata which describe the pipeline. And if I go deeper inside, there is this Mojo model, and this is our format, how we represent the models. And I can show you even closer, I will open one more, So I will go to location uh, of the model when I exported that. So it was sparkling water model and I call it demo. So this is my two transformers on the, on the disk and there is this module model. And module model is our format how to represent models. The history, if I go you know, five, six years back, we started with uh, the model as a code. So still there is capability that we can export the model as a Java code, which was great, which was great for high performance uh, 
environment, the problem of the code is that you have to compile it. And there was like showstopper a lot of times in the production that people were dealing with huge models where they were generating the code which has gigabytes. And then suddenly you are struggling with compiling that code. And uh, even like a uh, compiler doesn't, doesn't you know, support the size of the code. So then we rethink our uh, model representation strategy and say, okay, let's do representation which, is, uh, which we can use to represent the model without the code. And that's the, we call it Mojo. And if you know P PMML, for example, this is similar, similar, uh, similar, similar, uh, similar uh, kind of the strategy how to represent a model, encode individual transformers, encode the metadata, and use the production. Why we decided for our internal model, we figured out that, for example, at the time PMML was not so great for the big model. You know, PML is the format we represent model in XML, and you know you can take random forest model, generate 50 trees with depth 30, and suddenly you have XML, which are also gigabyte size. So we decided let's go with our binary model, and that's what we are using in the Mojo. Uh, Secret is that you can unzip the mod mojo and go deeper. You can see all the meta information. You can see also a lot of details about the mojo, which are stored in the JSON format. You will see the metrics which we collected during the training time, and you can you can use them during some model governance process and so on. So that's what I wanted to explain was the mojo, and what we will do as the last next step is. It's just technical step. I will also export the schema which Spark used to represent data. So what I did, I load the data through the H2, then I, uh, then I represent the data as a Spark data frame. And right now, the next step is to extract that data frame schema and save it as a JSON. So this is just a nice operation to avoid the schema redefinition during the deployment process. So I will just save it. If I go, if I go to the disk and show you what, how it looks like, the schema is just another JSON, which contains, in fact, all the meta information or about all the statistics which we collected in h frame. We also attach them to the Spark schema as well. So you can use them as well uh, in the model uh, for model deployment. But it's really Spark schema with Spark data types just represented in JSON. I will just verify that uh, consistency that I can load the data, load the schema from the disk back and compare it with the actual data frame, uh, data frame schema. So you see that assert uh, was successful, no failure. So the cons consistency is, uh, was satisfied. And then the next step is to deploy, deploy that pipeline, which I, uh, which I define. For deployment, I mentioned that I will use Spark Streaming. And the Spark Streaming is, uh, uh, I will use, uh, it's called a Spark Structure Steam, a st a sp a Spark Structure st Streaming. We, uh, where I can use the pipeline. So I will switch to my VI instance and uh, show you what I will do. It's really simple, uh, simple script. And I will call it score sparking pipeline and in increase the font size. And this is, I have to say, this is really example from the Spark, you know, how to use structure, structure, structure streaming, but instead of using a pure Spark pipeline, I will use the pipeline which I built, which composed of the Spark transformer and H2 and H2 model. So what I will do, I will just uh, create the Spark session. There's this Spark. This is classical Spark. Always when you are dealing with Spark, create the Spark session. The second thing, load uh, uh, the model which I created. The model is the pipeline which I save in this session. So 
this is this pipeline. So I will just load it, uh, load it from the disk. And for the loading, I'm not using any H2 or Sparking Water specific API. This is pure Spark API because the pipeline is Spark pipeline. There is no difference, no, no, no specific uh, H2 things. And then I will load the schema. This is my, uh, this is my shortcut which I wanted to take. I will load the schema which I represented as a JSON. I will trans and will load it from disk and represent as Spark schema. And I will do one more technical trick. I will append there field which is called ID. And this is just technical trick for deployment because when I'm deploying the model and dealing with a lot of events which are coming, I need to recognize the event. I need to some, somehow uh, need to track the event. So I will say all the events which are coming, they have to have all the features which are used during the training plus the ID, which is the identifier of the, of, the, of the event. It can be timestamp, but something which uh, uniquely identify the event. And then it's just classical Spark streaming. Define the, uh, I need to define the Spark stream, which loads the data. I will, this is like kind of the like simplified, simplified example because I will use uh, this base data stream. So I will just point the input or source, the uh, stream source to a folder. And I will feed that folder with the files which represent uh, individual events which are coming from data source. Then I will transform the st uh, stream with the uh, transformer, with the pipeline which I loaded from disk, and write the output of the, of the stream to the memory, to the memory table. Normally I would probably use some, uh, some, some another thing like S3 bucket or some uh, 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 Kafka, Kafka stream, but this is just for example. So I just create the table in the memory, and what I will do, I will just query, query the table in the regular intervals and print the event we have scored. So let's try to uh, let's try to run it. So I will go to my run script, and this is called deploy Sparkling pipeline, and just to, this is very technical. Deployment script just launched Spark through, uh, through the PySpark, pass my script, my Python script, which I just show you, define how much memory I need for, uh, for the driver and pass the parameter. Where is the model, where is the data, and uh, where is the schema, and that's it. So let's try it, I hope. It will work in this uh, in the settings. So I will launch it. You see, still the same part, uh, the same Spark 2.4. So uh, the Spark will load the pipeline. It will load. It will load the schema and start predicting. I have some already some data on the disk. So if I go to this window, I have folder where where is data. Uh, Gen data, so there are two uh, free files already generated, but let's start a new generator. And I think there is a parameter start ID, I will say four. And this will generate a new events to this like disk based data source. And you'll see that on this side, the stream is predicting. You know, like there is events coming with the IDs. And what models is doing is just saying, okay, this even probably the runtime will be 17 hours or 11 hours or six hours. And that's how I'm, I'm able to deploy the model. So pretty simple, you know, you take the pipeline, the Spark pipeline, take, uh, which contains the H2 model. You don't care about any H2 specific stuff. You just save the pipeline and deploy as a Spark stream. This is really, Classical, classical engineering. So I will kill, I will kill uh, this job. I will remove my data, generate the data, and just to prepare for the next step. The next step is ah yes. Uh, no, not in this, not in this demo. 
but I can I can use you know I can point to the if I would have uh, distributed Spark cluster running, I would just point the point the Spark master variable to that cluster, and it's still the classical Spark process. There is no uh, no there are no limitations. Could you, could you do training with a cluster like that? Oh uh, yes 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 yeah. Yes, both, both of them. I can launch this uh, this Spark streaming on the let's say if I have a cluster of five machines, I can launch it on that five machines and it will be classical Spark Spark streaming. The H2 models, which is uh, which is pa part of the uh, part of the pipeline, it doesn't need to have running H2 during the inference time. It's really just the model itself and tiny library which define the runtime, how to interpret the model. And the interpretation of model is, for example, if there is a linear model, it just take the, the expression which represent the linear model and just execute it. The same for tree models. There is some uh, uh, optimized representation of the tree, we just pass the even from the tree and that's it. So that brings me to the second part of the talk. Um, this is, you know, like I was showing how to combine sparking water and H2O. And in this case, you have to be really expert. You have to know how to do feature engineering, how to do, how to, uh, how to uh, extract the signal from the data, and also how to build the model. In this case, I really simplify all the stuff. But you can imagine that in reality, you have much bigger data, much uh, harder problems, and you have to really experiment to get really good results. And to simplify that, we created the product which is called Drys AI. And this is our uh, product which is based on the knowledge which we uh, gain from uh, the stuff which we were doing for the last uh, seven years from the field, you know, how to automate, how to simplify data science jobs. And Drys AI is really like for non-experts, like you, you don't want to deal with uh, feature engineering, you don't, you, don't want to, you don't want to deal with the model tuning. You just have a data, you have a problem, you know what you would like to predict, and you know your constraints. If it is model complexity, if it is a time, or if it is accuracy. And you pass this data and your constraints to address AI, and inside address AI will do the best possible job to give you to extract the signal from data, do a lot of experiments with, for the feature engineering, and then give you the best possible model, which gives the best possible <laughs> results. In this case, we shift, you know, in the in the in the open source domain, uh, we let Spark doing to do feature engineering, but in the Dress AI case. We'll do that by ourselves. We'll do our experimentation. So we keep Spark still in the picture for this data engineering where we need it to compose the data sources, to join the tables. But then if you have uh, data in tabular format where you know where is your target, just pass it to the Dress AI and inside that we'll do the best, we'll do the magic to give you the best possible model. And then story repeat. If we build this dress eye model, it has the same module representation, which is a little bit richer. It has to encode all these feature engineering operations which are handling and also the models which we are having in dress AI. And there is a variety of the models. There is like linear models, there is like SGBoost model, there are H2 models. So a lot of models, there are ensembles. So the module is much more complex but you can still deploy it with the same scenario. So that's what I would like to show you. So I will switch back to the console and I already started Dress AI. So I hope that it's running. So it's not running because I'm not on the, on the VPN. So let's, let's fix it. And this will be fun because I don't know I don't know my VPN password. So let's connect to the VPN. Ah, perfect. So I'm uh, I launched the installs of Dress AI. 
loaded the data. So this is my data, which I, the same data which I use for the, uh, for the previous demo. I can look at the data. So the same, the same, or the same similar view as the open source product provides. It's here as well. So you see distribution, you see the basic properties which we collect about the data. And there is also, you know, like I can visualize data as well. I can look at the interesting aspects of data. I can look at the correlation graph, which, uh, which uh, feature seems correlated. I can uh, look at the uh, data heat map, you know, how many values are how many times represented. Uh, I will not go to, too much to the detail, but there are a lot of different uh, webinars and also uh, here uh, in the headquarters, a lot of meetups which are describing what we are doing inside from different technical perspective or machining perspective. But what I will do, I would like to launch the, I would like to launch the experiment. And just to show you what's the settings. So I will just follow the same script. I will use all the data. I will not, use, I will not uh, even uh, remove any rows. I will just use it directly. I will just specify my target, prediction target, T total, number of the seconds for uh, uh, number of seconds, how long address I, uh, how long it took for the right side to build the model, and then I specify my basic requirement. So I will specify accuracy. Okay, I would like to have high accuracy. Give me that quickly, and I don't want to have complex model, too much complex model. There is a lot of you know deep story about that what we are doing inside, but I will just launch it and let it let it run. And what it is doing right now, it's really exploring the space of the possible feature transformation or the possible models to find the best possible model. I took a little bit shortcut because uh, before the meetup, I already uh, built the model. So I already built that model and uh, it's not the best model, but I didn't provide it the best data. But you can see the results. There is like, you can see the, the most important variables. You can even, you can deploy the model directly from the UI as the, as the Amazon Lambda. But what I would like to do, I would like to uh, download the module scoring pipeline. So this is what I'm interested in right now. I will take this module and deploy as a Spark pipeline. So I download it. Just, I would like to show you what's the structure. So it's, Right now, it's seven megabytes. The mocho it's uh, again a zip file. In the zip file, what you can find in zip file is multiple multiple files. There is the model itself. There is some Java runtime. There is example how to how to run it directly on your uh, machine. But I will skip that part. But we'll go directly to the definition of the stream. So let's see how I can, how I can define, how I, how I can define, how I can use it in the Spark stream. And there is a pipeline which I already prepared and voila, it's almost the same example. Only the difference is that I took slightly different path. So I'm, the model which is exported from Dry's AI is the, I would call it pure mojo model, pure model representation as is represented in H2O. I can take it, I can bundle that as a Spark pipeline and save it. I will just avoid that, uh, I will just avoid that step and I will use the shortcut which is called, which is exported by the uh, PySparkling Water API and the shortcut will just load the model and represent it directly as the Spark pipeline. So this is this part, just I will point to the model file, which I downloaded, and the rest is really the same. There is no, no difference. I will load the schema, I will load the input data stream, I will transform data stream with the model which I loaded. The model is just Spark pipeline, so no difference, and uh, the output I will save to the table and run it. So let's show you the run script. Again, there is uh, really 
similar approach. So the same thing, I'm just go through the Spark, I will ask Spark, launch me this Python script, I will pass configuration for the Spark. One more thing, I have to pass the uh, one jar file, which defines the runtime. The runtime is served by Dress AI, that's a Mojo jar or Java jar, which are downloaded as a part of the uh, model. So I just pass it to the Spark to use it as the, as the runtime for the model. And then the rest is the same as I used in the previous example. So let's deploy it, run it. So it's, I would say, the similar path. The model is loaded, represents this as the Spark pipeline. The Spark stream is created. There should be nothing in the directory which serve as the data source for the Spark stream. So I should, I should give the empty predictions and I can start serving. So start data gen, and I should see some predictions coming from the, from the stream. Okay, perfect, I have the first prediction. So you see, you know, the same script, just the different model from different uh, tool from the, uh, from different tool of H2O ecosystem, but the same deployment scenario. I can even go a little bit further, and what I can do, I can deploy them together. And there is no trick. You probably, okay, I will kill this. I will remove my data, generated data, and I will deploy them together. I just defined a slightly different scoring script, score both, the same schema, loading the models, represent, representing them as the Spark pipelines, and defining input stream. I have only single input stream, but I have two scoring streams. So I feed the data, then I have a fork, and the fork will, one fork will score with the uh, Sparky water model, the second fork will uh, score with the with the dress AI model, and I will just save them to the table and then compare. I would like to, I'm interested in comparison of the prediction power. So if it is, you know, I can use that, for example, for A-B testing. I can have another part of the pipeline which will say, okay, be a little, a little bit more uh, pessimistic in the prediction and took the longer time, or be optimistic and took shorter time, or whatever, whatever, whatever is my metric to, to select the model prediction. And I will just deploy it, deploy both pipelines, and let's see. And it's this really the same template, you know, no changes, just a little bit more Spark code to uh, play with data sources and with the pipelines. And uh, if I load it, I can see the table with three columns, ID of the event, and prediction of the dress AI model and of the sparking water pipeline. And let me start generating data. And this is really random data, so don't expect the greatest, greatest results. And also I didn't spend too much time in model building, but just to show you that uh, what the models are doing, that they are you know, agreeing, almost. And, uh, Simple, simple thing like that. Just take your model and deploy it as a Spark stream. So let's kill it and let's go back here. Uh, back here to the uh, to the uh, presentation. I just would like to show you one more one one more piece of information. I told you that. The exporting, mod, uh, exporting model, which is exported from Dress AI, is much more complex. And you, this is visualization of the model at, uh, at the module level of the, of the model which is deployed. And all these small boxes, which you can see on the, on the slide, is small transformers. And you see the complexity of the model, you know, which uh, Dress AI is generating. So it's really like, a lot of feature engineering, a lot of feature transformation, which are encoded in the in the pipeline in the 
in the expertise pipeline. And you can imagine you know, doing that by hand is quite challenging. And Dress AI will do that for, uh, uh, for you automatically, or will try to do the best possible job to, do, to provide this kind of the pipeline automatically. Uh, for the plan for the future, and this is like maybe a sneak preview for if you are interested to do, go to the H2O world. We have a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, lot of features which we like to show to people to, you know, to uh, extend our reach in the machine learning, in the machine learning uh, process. So there is like some capabilities, how to support uh, project and model management, how to support model monitoring. And just a sneak preview, what we would like to show you, oh, I cannot exit this one. Okay, let me go here. This is uh, the demo which is like, uh, will be part of the H2O world, how to deploy such pipeline and monitor it. And monitor it in the sense that I will be interested in the uh, data shift. If the data input data changes, how I can detect that, how I can visualize that, and how I can trigger ar alarms and you know inform the people. So this is just sneak preview, which uh, what we are uh, preparing for this event. So if you are interested to come, you will see uh, me or uh, my colleague Kuba presenting presenting that part of the of the of the of the uh, ecosystem. For the future, for this part of for the model deployment, uh, we are working on a lot of stuff. So there is a lot of uh, stuff on uh, model tooling, how to support, uh, for example, how to visualize the models or how to combine those models together, how to combine the open source models with the DRAS AI models, how to combine them to the unified pipelines and then deploy as the Spark pipeline, as I showed today, how to inject these monitoring aspects, uh, specific like high-level monitoring aspects. Also, uh, ongoing work in both project C++ runtime, how to take this mojo and deploy to the edge devices. And you know, edge device, probably not so friendly for Java runtime. So there is like, uh, work which will be really soon to give capability to uh, to uh, interpret the model through the through the binary c plus or c plus plus runtime and that's that's it for me thank you for your attention if you have any question i think this is the right time to ask them i will just remind you you know the part of the uh, work which i showed today is open source you can easily try it uh, the source code will be on our GitHub at our H2O meetups, including these slides. Uh, the H2O word, you heard about uh, the H2O word at the beginning. So if you are in the area, if you are familiar, if you are interested with the H, uh, H2O, and uh, if you are interested to see what people are doing with H2O, what the customers are doing, what, uh, what are the challenges of the customers with respect to the data science, please come. It's in San Francisco. And we're also hiring different position, engineers, QA, support. So if you are interested, just send email to our, uh, to our, uh, to our career or visit uh, our pages. You will see a lot of open position. And you know, if you have any question, I'm here. Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, there is um, what, um, as I mentioned, uh, what, DRAS, uh, what DRAS AI is doing is doing a lot of experimentation, a lot of, it's a really massive experimentation, massive exploration of the space. So oftentimes there is a lift. There are, of course, uh, cases, for example, if you have really good data and you did some feature in engineering uh, before passing data to DRAS AI, then the result will be comparison with h or Spark models. But then there's always the cost of the feature engineering which you have to do manually. So 
in this case is not so big lift, but you always have to count how much work you spend on your feature engineering. Mm -hmm. How to assess the trade-off? I spend two hours in feature engineering and I get interest in accuracy versus spending more time and then... Yeah, it really depends on the, on the use case. So a lot of time we see in the, in the field that people have years of experience in feature engineering. They have uh, features which are uh, maintained, managed for years, and they are like coming for years. So if I uh, compare uh, that years of experience and give that value, it's like really high value. And then if I can take the raw data and run that, oftentimes we, get, we give the same, the same results. And uh, there'll be a few talks at the uh, HTO world about, about the uh, usage of the SAIs, about the lift, how, how much it's improved. All the other year, the dry list is MLI, right? So you... Yes, yes. And I didn't, I didn't go to the details. So uh, when I speak about dress AI, I really, in this talk, I focus on model building. But there is a lot of tooling, if I go back, there is a lot of tooling inside that I can uh, deploy the models you know, as the Lambda. I can interpret the model. And interpretation, this is like quite an uh, interesting topic, because that DRASI gives you the notion what the model is doing inside. That's quite interesting for uh, the customers which are regulated. Big banks, they need to explain what the model is doing. And we are trying to help. There is also part of the Dress AI which generates the report, what we did inside. It's a very detailed report, how we fine tune the models, what kind of feature in engineering we did inside. And that's another uh, quite important part for putting the model to the production. Because a lot of uh, customers, at least in our space, they need to keep this kind of the documentation, how they transfer data, who touched the data, and if the, if the uh, approach, how they deal with data, if it was statistically sound. So there is also the, the additional value of the RACI. Yes? Do you plan to support Go language? Sorry? Do you plan to support Go language? Uh, for uh, which, okay, um, for, um, in open source, uh, right now we don't have plan to support Go language, but it's open source. Uh, the API is well defined. It's uh, we have examples of the uh, client APIs generators, which generates Java code, which generates Python code, which generates C# code. Just Go language never came to uh, to our pipeline, but you know, feel free to participate. For uh, Dress AI, the situation is much easier. Uh, our API is based on, you know, at this time it's some kind of proto, uh, proto buffers. So in theory, we can uh, generate the Go client and support the Go to access the platform from, from the Go language. It's not done yet because nobody asks. But if there is interest, we can always you know, evaluate that and put, put, to our, put to our roadmap. Technically, inside, we are using Go. We are combining a lot of languages. There is a Java, there is a Scala, there is a Go, there is a Python, C++, C, whatever you know, we need for a particular part of the, of the ecosystem. Uh, that's a uh, uh, work of Pritvi, so our uh, one of the, our the most senior people in the company, and uh, the bo uh, he, let's say the coding is done in TypeScript, and uh, the UI or UX part of side is uh, hand handcrafted, and the motivation was really motivation from the movies. Like the you know Star Trek and uh, this kind of the movies. 
Uh -huh. You use support of Opera directly, or are you going to use support GRPC? One more time, please, if you can repeat the question. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the buffer, are you going to support GRPC? GRPC support. Are you going to Yeah. So uh, in uh, open source HTO, uh, right now there is no such plan because we have we, uh, the API which we are using to communicate with the client is the REST API. Uh, for the REST AI, we have, it's our RPC system because when we started, the gRPC was not so friendly to the, uh, to the front end front-end clients. So there was a lot of problem with integrating gRPC in the TypeScript. So uh, we defined a clone of uh, RPC system, but it's not gRPC. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so when you're automatically choosing the best fit model, are these all like um, uh, like basic machine learning models, or can you do that for like neural networks and pick the best parameters or whatever? Yeah. So uh, I will define the question to open source and uh, open source and RAS AI. For open source, the AutoML you can configure with all the models which are in the in the open source stack. So there is. Classical model, we call them classical models, but you know, like three models, GLM and so on. There are also neural networks, but very simple, you know, fully connected uh, uh, neural network. Uh, so you can use it. For dress AI, we select the set of algorithms based on the setup. So whatever, you know, you specify this constraint, whatever is your problem, if it is time series, if it is more text-oriented problem, then internally we select the set of the models, and you know one of the models is the TensorFlow, which we are using for text problems. Yeah. And there is like, uh, if you look to our documentation, there is like a lot of fine tuning knobs, how we can even tune the TensorFlow architecture which we are using. Okay, yeah. thanks. And just to clarify, it's not always, it's really different. Uh, we have a lot of heuristic insight based on our experience and brain of our data scientists based on our Kegel and masters, which are we are taking their brain and projecting to the uh, projecting to the uh, project and uh, really trying to do the best thing what they are doing in their Kegel competitions. Are, are you finding when talking to data scientists that they want to use the GPU all to themselves, or are they willing to share? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think, uh, from my experience, every data scientist, as every competitive data 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 scientist, is machine hung hungry. So infinite number of GPUs can be consumed. That's my my experience. So whatever number of GPUs you provide them, they will use them. They will. I'm using um, just. In the office, I'm sitting next of the uh, in front of Dimitri, and under his tables there is machine which we call Q1, and the machine is used for Dimitri experiments, and that machine is always busy, so I'm using that machine as a heater for my legs. So it's a perfect <laughs> it's a perfect situation. You know, that's in front of me. I have a heater, and all the GPU power is going to my uh, you know, feet, and I feel comfortable. <laughs> in, in, in general, though, you'd recommend a user of driverless AI have at least one GPU to themselves? It's, uh, I would say the right answer should be on the problem, based on the problem. So uh, it really, there are some of the problems where the GPUs are not so useful. Yeah. And uh, mostly for... Uh, Feature engineering, we are using a lot of CPU, CPU power for model building, you know, XGBoost, LightGPM, uh, TensorFlow directly to the GPU. Also, it depends on the data. So there is also a trade-off, you know, transfer to the GPU and how to keep the data um, hot on the GPU. So there is also a trade-off. Small data, okay, will not offload into the GPU. We just use the CPUs. 
especially since we have like partnership with the IPM, you know, power machine, a lot of cores, a lot of, a lot of competition power, a lot of, you know, a lot of GPUs. We can use all of them if it is necessary. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? Okay, thank you for your attention, you. and I think... Yes. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you.